Okay. And this is more how, of how I'd like to see the Grand Canyon. Yeah, that would, I'm a kayaker type. But the evolutionist's uh, conclusion is that it forms slowly by a little water and lots of time. And the creationist says, no, 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 no. It was a lot of water. It was quickly with a lot of water and a little time. So let's see which one makes most sense. And what the evolutionists do, and you see it in their textbooks, they try any lot. They do. They erase the the line between the facts and their conclusion. Whenever they say millions of years or billions of years, or whatever, even if they say the river carved the canyon, that's their conclusion. That's not verifiable. And I, I will submit today that that river could not possibly have carved that canyon. So these are the things that are verifiable about the the park. You know, Grand the Colorado River inside the Grand Canyon is 277 miles long. It's 33 feet, 300 feet wide, average. Minimum width, 76, average depth, 44 feet, and greatest depth, 85. And what I was looking for was what's the, what's the elevation where the river goes in and what is it when the river flows out? And I notice here, one of the facts is uh, Phantom Ranch is at 2,400 feet. Oh, it's like, where was that? But here's all the things that this is their interpretation, millions and billions of years. That's their interpretation of the facts. That's not a fact. Those are all their conclusions. You can't verify it. But where is this uh, phantom rack, uh, phantom ranch? That's right in the middle of the Grand Canyon. Well, that doesn't tell me where the river, how, what the elevation is, where it went in and where it went out. It does tell me that this is government, their website, the NS, NPS.gov, uh, National Park Service, descends 2,000 feet. Okay, well, it still doesn't tell me what it was. But it did, that, that website did link me to this really neat topo map topographic-map.com, really neat. Wherever you click, it'll give you the elevation. So I clicked above Glen Canyon Dam and it's 3,600 feet. I clicked below Glen Canyon Dam and it's 3,100 feet. So I'm, I'm just close enough. The, the Colorado River flows into the canyon at roughly 3,100 feet. Then I went to Lake Mead at the other end of it and it's 1,200 feet. So that's roughly 2,000 feet like they said. But now I have my elevation thing. So now let's ask some questions about the Grand Canyons. And I want you to ask your teachers and guides these questions because questions that aren't answered properly don't go away. And hopefully it make, wakes them up at night. Like that little kid who asked, where'd you put the dirt? Okay, so <laughs> big question is, how'd the river flow uphill to cut the canyon? It's like, what are you talking about? Well, we just showed you that the river flowed in at 3,100 feet and flowed out at 1,200 feet. Yet in the middle, that canyon rises up a mile above the river. So are we supposed to uh, supposed to think that the, if that if that river carved the canyon, how did it flow up there to cut it? No, that doesn't make any sense. And why did the river flow around the Kayabab Plateau? It flew instead of it, it could have gone and <laughs> and then other ones. Why are layers so flat? Uh, Helen talked about that. Why isn't there any erosion between the layers? Uh, why are there slanted layers under the flat layers? This is Walt Brown standing in one in front of one of those. And why are there seven, seven of the 12 geologic columns are missing? Why is that? And why are there 100 million, 100 million years of sediment missing according to their timeline? How does a river cut a canyon 18 miles wide? And how do side canyons form? You know, these are just as deep as Grand Canyon, but there's no river. So if the river carved the canyon, what, called the, what carved the side canyons? Because there's no river. Okay, and why are the canyons longer to the north than to the south? And this is about the guy who said he dug it. And how did it erode 800 cubic miles? That's what's missing from the Grand Canyon. And to put that in perspective, all the other rivers of the world have eroded 300 cubic miles. Yeah, something special went on here. And before you cut the Grand Canyon, you gotta get uh, do the Great, Denud Great Denudation, where there's 2,000 cubic miles of sediment. And what force would move that? And then we talked about this rock. How do you get a five to 10 ton rock raised up into a layer of sedimentary rocks? Because it came from the bottom right and now it's up in the top middle. Yeah, Mr. Evolutionist, explain that with your blind chance and random collisions of atoms. And, and that rock is at the Isis temple. And then this is Walt Brown's sons. In that inner gorge, 46, 000, or 46 miles long, why'd the river cut into the hard granite instead of going wider at the softer sediment? That's a tough one. And when you got the inner sh in the Vishnu schist, it's crushed granite, crushed basement rock. What force would do that? And then why is the Schneebly Hill formation missing in the Grand Canyon? See right here, <laughs> this is from, uh, yeah, how do rocks show young earth? This is uh, his Genesis history, they, they show this. Okay, so what's on top of the Hermit formation? Well, it's the Coconino sandstone. 
Yeah, that's in the Grand Canyon. You go 70 miles away, what's on top of the Hermit Formation? Well, it's the Schneebly Hill Formation, which is 800 to 1,000 feet thick, separating it from the Coconino Sandstone. Well, how's that going to happen? Yeah, they don't put that on the website. They don't put that in the textbooks. And how did the funnel form? Once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's uh, and this the funnel right there. You got Vermilion Cliffs on top at 7,200 feet, and you got Echo Cliffs on the other one at six on the at south, 6,700 feet. You, and how? <laughs> and then you got Marble Canyon, 4,800 feet. So those cliffs are roughly I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 feet feet deep. So you got 2,000 foot cliffs. And what's that? What's right here at the top of one of those cliffs? That's this uh, this pothole. A pothole is formed as when a rock gets in a vortex in the uh, muddy river and it's going to dig a hole like that. How in the whole world do you get a pothole to form 3,300 feet above the river on a 2,000 foot cliff that's 4.25 miles away from the river? Yeah, that's an anomaly. And how do you explain that with blind chance and random collisions of atoms? You cannot. You cannot. Your theory's wrong. And that's Walt Brown talking about it. And he asked the question himself why was water flowing so rapidly this high? at the upper edge of a 2000 foot cliff. It makes no sense from there. And how do barbed canyons form? These are, these are, those are the barbs pointing north. And I, again, I had way too much fun with that elevation tool. So I click at the top or the bottom of this barb and then I go up and it was 5,500 feet and it drops to 5,300 feet. So that barb dropped 200 feet. This one dropped 200 feet. This one dropped 100 feet. This one dropped 200, two or 300. So what you're seeing is the land is sloping to the northeast, and this one dropped 200 feet. So it's sloping to the northeast, and yet the river is flowing to the southwest. How in the world does that happen? And why'd the river flow around the Kayabab Plateau? Again, it went right through it. Let's use that elevation tool. You know, the Kayabab Plateau, it's 9,000 feet, 8,000 feet, 7,300 feet, 7,000 feet on the south rim. So it, that can't, that it, where that river flowed through, it was going through the, the, the cliffs are 7,000 feet. Well, let's go around the Kaibab Plateau, 4,800 feet, 5,300, 61, 64, 60, 57. The river should have flowed around the Kaibab Plateau on the south or even the north, 64, 52, 56. It should have gone around either the north or the south. And yet, why would it go right through? And what force causes a plateau to rise a mile, raise a mile in the hair? In the air. And how about Red Butte? We talked about this before, but repetition is good. A thousand feet of sediment capped with volcanic rock. And notice where it is. It's real close to Grand Canyon. How do you do that? Well, you know what that is, actually? <laughs> That's what it used to be everywhere. Okay, now this is how the government tries to answer these questions. This is the National Park Service website. And I just updated this a couple of weeks ago. Notice it's the story of how Grand Canyon came to be, blah, blah, blah. The story begins about 2 billion years ago, blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's a story. This isn't science. This is a story. And where else did I hear that before? This is a general ed textbook at St. Cloud State. The origin of the geosphere is a story of the birth of our planet. The story begins in an immense cloud. It's a story. This isn't science. This is a story. And if you don't catch it right at the beginning, you're going to think you're doing science. But no, this is science fiction. It's a story. Can you verify it? No, you can't. Can you bear the by the billions of years they talk about? No, those aren't facts. Those are conclusions. Okay, and the scientists know that the Colorado Colorado River carved the canyon. No, can you ver? No, no, that's not a fact. Scientists know that. How do you know that? Can you verify it? No, they can't. That's their opinion. That's not a fact. But that's what's on their website, and so that's what our taxpayers are money for. And it's not true. And I'll show you why. But they admit this part, at least, the Kaibab Plateau, a high point through which the river gingerly slices, pose a pro poses a problem for the geologist. And what's the problem? Water certainly doesn't flow uphill. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a real big problem. So why do you think the river cut the canyon? And then it goes on to say, well, keeping these few chapters in the Colorado history books in mind, what's the chapter? The river carved the canyon. They'll never get the right answer if they keep that chapter in the book. And geologists have proposed a number of different solutions. And then why are there 100 million years of sediment missing, according to their geologic column? And this is Forbes. The mystery of the Grand Canyon's missing billions of years may be solved thanks to new tectonics models. Missing billions of years? I didn't see that on the website. 
Okay, and it says the great unconformity has perplexed geologists since it was first uh, described nearly 150 years ago. 500 million year, year old Tapit sandstone is directly overlaying the 1.4 to 1.8 billion year old Vishnu schist. Yeah, 500 million years. So there's no sediment that got was missing for a billion years. And they go on to just think of the red bluffs and cliffs of the Grand Canyon as Earth's, as Earth's her, history book. You can jump back almost 2 billion years into the plant, planet's past. But that textbook is also missing pages. In some areas, more than a billion years worth of rocks have disappeared. A billion years of rocks have just disappeared. Think that through. A billion years. And how old is the Earth? What, 4.5 billion? And so he just lost a quarter of the Earth just somehow? No, your perspective of the past is wrong. So that you may come up with these foolish ideas. And this is what they say. The team reports that a series of small yet violent faulting or faulting events may have, that's a fuzzy word, may have rocked the region during the breakup of the ancient supercontinent called Rhododinia. The resulting havoc likely tore up the ground around the Grand Canyon, causing rocks and sediment to wash away into the ocean. May have and likely are super fuzzy words. And like I said last night, I know, a, or I met a, biology teacher at a secular community college that uh, he has his students write down fuzzy words as they go through the textbooks. And so that's a great idea. So then the kids know when they're being taught science and when they're being taught fiction like this, this is fiction. And the team's finding could help sci scientists fill in missing pieces of what happened. How come I didn't hear see that on the website? Okay. Now here's how they hy hypothesize. They got four Four ideas on how the Grand Canyon formed. The first one's the Little Colorado Hypothesis. And it says, in order for this theory to work, the ancestral Colorado would have needed to flow eastward over the continental divide. Well, I'll throw that idea out. The other one's the Northwest Flowing River Hypothesis. In order for this to work, the Kaibab Plateau couldn't look quite like it does today. And unfortunately, no sedimentary deposits have been found to support this theory. Well, I'll throw that theory out. But they do have this spillover theory, <clears throat> the catastrophic draining of ancient lakes. Now, I go along with that one. That is what happened. The problem is they got the lakes in the wrong place. It says the Colorado River was temporarily dammed up behind the Kayabab Plateau. What? No, we just showed you that it, it couldn't have been dammed up behind there. It could have flowed around the bottom or on the top. It couldn't have been. So throw this one out. And then they got the collapse of the groundwater, car groundwater karts system. And so that's a brand new one, or it just happened to collapse at the right places, but that still doesn't explain the inner gorge. Why did it, why did it cut into that crystalline rock instead of go wider on the sedimentary rock? So throw this one out. So they got four ideas. None of them work. And if you want to hear the problems with the <laughs> RSR has their, their list of shows, you know, lists of when I've been discs, um, lists of shocked evolutionists. I love that one. I play that one at St. Cloud State on my Bluetooth. But you can see the list of the problems with the river carve the canyon, problems with the millions of years, the problem with the flood carve the canyon. Again, go into rsr.org, my favorite website, and just search Grand Canyon Month if you're interested in Grand Canyon. And I listened to that as I was driving out to Denver, and it was so much fun. And then what Walt Brown does, and we saw this earlier, he's got a failure. This is, this is how he rates them. He puts all the theories on the top, and then he ranks them. You know, he's got these different lay, different factors, uh, um, things on the side like uh, limestone and all these features. And if it's if it explains it perfectly, it's green. And if it doesn't at all, it's red. And if it's could have, it's marginal. It's yellow. And so all of his are green. I don't see a green anywhere else on under on any other of those theories. Same thing here. You know, the missing river, all that. So again, he's got some really good resources, and we're going to talk about these little things. But um, yeah, now this is their conclusions. It's all based on the geologic column. So let's take a look at that geologic column. It was finalized in 1879. This is before radiometric dating. They had all the layers there, and they had them all named in 1879. This is horse and buggy technology. You know what they invented in 1879? It was the light bulb. And this is what is holding the science hostage today. They're, they're thinking of millions of years, and it's not. It's not. They've got those blood cells in dinosaur bones. They got nerves in dinosaur bones. They got soft tissue in dinosaur bones. They got carbon 14 in dinosaur bones, carbon and, or coal and diamonds. There's, it's just a bad perspective of the past. And this is uh, from their website. Actually, no, this, I updated my, I went into there recently. 
This used to be on their website, but it's not anymore. Okay, it says that they got layers from the Cambrian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and Permian periods are present. That's true, but it's very de deceptive because why did they why they ignore the missing layer of Silurian, the Ordovician layers right down at the bottom? You know, so that's a very deceptive statement. And maybe that's why it was taken down. Maybe enough people pointed out to them. It's like, yeah, it's deceptive. Okay, and then they got this uh, for the kids on the Grand Canyon website. Over millions of years, can you verify that? No, you can't. That's not a fact. These bones, shells, footprints, leaves, and other remains turned into stone. Footprints. Footprints. How, how long do your footprints stay in the mud? Yeah, over millions of years? I don't think so. So if Randy Galuza was in school, he'd be asking, hey, professor, um, what present process is today are preserving footprints in stone all over the world because they find dinosaur footprints even in Antarctica and every continent. And so fossils, again, I touched on it last night. If When you're talking to an evolutionist, ask them, hey, is that deer on the side of the road going to turn into a fossil? And it's no, it's going to decompose, it's going to scavenge. And I said, and that's, you're right. The only way a fossil forms is if it's buried rapidly. Therefore, any layer that has fossils in it was laid down rapidly. That, that's that geologic column. That's not sign of a million years. That's sign of a flood. And then we talked about these nautiloids that Steve Austin found and one fossil per square yard and they're directionally uh, uh, pointed and they think it was an underwater landslide. And I'm thinking maybe it's underwater <laughs> by the flood. And 15% of them were upright. And I talked about that. We did the math last night. We don't have to do it again. Perhaps the biggest question of all, now this question used to be on their website. It's not there anymore. Perhaps the biggest question of all, how the Colorado River chose this course and began carving the canyon still awaits a clear answer. Well, stop waiting. We've got a clear answer. You can update that to give the real clear answer. Now we're going to go through the real answers, the bulging and cracking. That's the key to the whole process. We're going to say that three times, bulging and cracking. And you heard about the hydroplate. We'll skip all over that. And then uh, how do you get those, uh, those slanted layers? That's from the hydroplate. It expa explains it all. We covered, <laughs> yeah, how do you get that rock up there? This is, the mud was flying and go back to last night's talk. You'll hear more of that. Everybody saw the plateau rose up. Yeah, this is kind of neat to see again. What's the force that rises that makes a plateau go up? It's uh, hydraulics. The mountain sunk in, squirted the liquid, the lava out to the side that put pressure on the sides and then they went up. Okay, and then the lava gets flows up there too, gets to the top, makes, makes a layer of lava on top of the sediment. And then you get this great, denud great denudation coming through. All this water coming through isn't going to wash away the lava, but it's going to wash away what the lava didn't cover. And that gives us Red Butte. Yeah, raise your hand if you've been to Red Butte. That's a thousand feet of sediment capped with volcanic rock. That whole area was covered with a thousand feet of sediment. So that's how you got that. That's how you remove the 2000 cubic miles. All that stuff was washed away. Well, what force is going to move 2,000 miles, 2,000 cubic miles? Yeah, how would that happen? Okay, and that brings us to the funnel. The funnel is the key to everything. And uh, again, that's 12 miles wide at the widest point. And just picture everything north of that line is sediment. Just picture that as a big ridge at one point in time. Okay. And this is a picture of, you know, if you're on one of the cliffs, if you're at Echo Cliffs, this is Brian Nichols Cliff of Vermilion Cliffs, 12 miles away. And this is halfway up. And that crack is where the Colorado River is flowing. And what cracked the Marble Canyon? How did that happen? And when you look from a satellite, you look down at that orangish ground, those are lake, lake bottoms. Those were, used to be lakes where you see that discoloration there. And they had huge lakes that were there. You know, you, and this is where, this is what we were, you know, I encourage people to get the, the, uh, puzzle on the plow by pu puzzle on the plateau by Mike Snavely, uh, creation, creation imper imperative.org. Yeah. It's a very good, he explains a lot of these. He goes there and he's got really, really, really good video. And hopefully we'll get that to start eventually. Okay. But keep in mind, and it's just not more, it's not just the lakes that have water. It's all that sediment that has water. And that's how Zion and Bryce formed. It's all the water coming out of the sediment side and eroding, which makes those really unique features. So these are big. Let's, let's take a look at arches. I could, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but arches. Arches is up there. That's in the bottom of the lake. Yeah, it's a lake. Draining of a lake. Arches. And, what's, and if you want, 
go into rsr.org and listen to their uh, their collapsing arches. Their average one to two arches a year has been cracking, uh, collapsing for 50 years, but they're not being formed that fast. And even Darwin's arch in the Galapagos, Galapagos fell. Yeah, but they're not being formed at that process. So why are they being? So that their timeline over millions of years doesn't make sense. And also Monument Valley, we talked about that last night. And that's just a dried up, that's the bottom of a lake. 1,400 feet of sediment are there underneath those things. So then it, there was a huge lake on top. When the lake drought drained, the water from the sand underneath it went to the surface and eroded out a, eroded everything out. Except for where it was hard on top, it eroded out the sides. That's how you get the mesas, buttes, and spires. Petrified forest is down here. And Walt Brown says there was a lot of silica in the water, in the lakes. And when the lakes cooled off, the silica had to go somewhere. So that went into the wood. And we still have the petrified wood today. Okay, and Grand Canyon, we're hoping we're going to get that flying for you. And <laughs> talk about the Grand Staircase too. Because even before the Great Denudation, there's a whole bunch of erosion before that. And I think that probably came during the flood. Okay, let's take a look at this lake, Grand Lake, 5,700 feet of elevation. It's got twice as much water as Lake Michigan, and it's got 2,100 cubic miles of water. And that's a mile high, so there's a lot of potential energy. And to put it in perspective, at Grand Junction, Colorado would have been, had 1,000 feet of water, 1,100 feet of water on top of it. And Page, Arizona would have had 1,400 feet of water on it. Of course, I think it was probably sediment. <laughs> I think it got 1,400 feet of sediment before that sediment washed away. And then uh, Farmington, New Mexico would have 350 feet of water. That's just one of the lakes. Okay. And then you got Hopi Lake down there, about the size of Lake Huron, 840 cubic miles of water. And you go look at those cities, they don't have a hundred, uh, Tuba City would have a thousand feet on it. Winslow would have a thousand feet and Holbrook would have a thousand foot. Holbrook or Holbrook. Somebody corrected me last time, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of water, a lot of potential energy you know, almost 3,000 cubic miles of water up there, a mile high. What's going to do? What's it going to ha What's going to happen when that breaches? And it does breach. It's going to breach right by that funnel. Okay. And so just think of this as a side view of the Vermilion Cliffs. You got that cliff on the left. You got the lake in the middle. And you got the, all that block faulting going up and down. You know, the, 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 Rock, the Rockies are climbing or sinking into the mantle. So it's squeezing the lava out and that's putting a lot of pressure on those faults and they're blocking, they're going up and down and that, or they keep going up. So that's going to change the, the water table. That's going to change the shoreline constantly. And so when they say there's no evidence for a lake there, that's like that because it didn't have time to put the evidence there. It kept on going from one place or it kept on changing the water level. And then eventually it's going to, it's going to overflow. I believe this was during the ice age is what I think is when there was a lot of precipitation. And so it either just got too full and overflowed, or maybe the lake with a block fault that tipped the lake. So it overflowed, or maybe there was a lake up, up, um, higher up that breached, but at whatever, whatever rate it overflowed and it, it breached there and it starts going over and it starts going faster and faster and faster, more and more water's going through and through and through, and it starts cutting down. And it's going faster and faster. And there's a rock that gets caught in a vortex and goes spinning around in circles. And that's what made the pothole. Okay. That's the river wasn't there. It's not the river. It's the overflowing lakes that made it. And then it cuts down 2000 feet and it's going to keep cutting down until it hits something that's hard. The Kayabab limestone was hard. Then it spreads out. And to put this in perspective with Niagara Falls, okay, this is 12 miles wide. Okay, Niagara Falls is about a three quarters of a mile wide. So the funnel compared to Niagara Falls, and just think if all that was water gushing through, just think of the damage that would do. Just think of all the sediment that that would wash away. And just think of all the weight that's pushing down on the mantle that would get washed away. And speaking of what water can do, the challenge at Glen Canyon. Yeah, this is from... Uh, <laughs> For a while in 1983, sheets of plywood were all that kept the mighty Glen Canyon Dam from overflowing. Yeah, it, would almost, it was almost a disaster. But it was, and you look at the spillways. Those are spillways. They're trying to drain that thing as fast as they can. And that's powerful. There's a man standing next to that. It's like, oh boy. But then it starts to, uh, starts to chunks of concrete. It starts, turns color. I think the dam might have even moved or struck, but they shut it down real fast. Because there's cavitation, super fast going, moving water, it's going to like implode on the surfaces, 
and it's gonna this is the this is what happened <clears throat> it was a it cut this is this is in the spillway keep in mind that's two feet of reinforced concrete or yeah and it cut a hole 32 feet deep 40 feet wide and 150 feet long and that was uh let's see and that was a, that's a man standing on there okay i gotta plug this in so my battery or so my phone okay all right now we're good and the same thing had happened at Guadal the Guadalupe River in uh, New Brun Brunsfels, Texas. They had a 30 inches of rain on one weekend, and it just cut through a it cut a canyon one mile wide, over 50 feet deep, and hundreds of yards wide, or a mile long, and a 50, 50 feet deep and hundreds of yards wide through solid rock, solid limestone. And they did it in 24 hours. <laughs> Listen to this. What would have taken nature thousands of years to create was created in about 24 hours. Well, same thing in uh, 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 Mount St. Helens. There was a mud flow that cut a canyon 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep in nine hours. So now if we didn't see that happen, we'd tell the, the kids in school, you know that little Tootle River that cut that canyon over millions of years? No, it didn't. That river didn't cut that canyon. That canyon made the river. That river is a consequence of the canyon. And the same thing is with Grand Canyon. And now we come to bulging and cracking. If you had a water balloon and you squeezed it, it's going to poke out wherever there's no pressure. And that's what's the same thing that's going to happen on Marble Canyon. Remember, it cut down, all that sediment's gone. There's no weight pushing down on that Marble Canyon. So guess what? It's going to crack. It's going to bulge. And then it, rock and tension isn't very strong. And then it's going to crack. And then notice on the sides of the sediment that was washed away, they're pointed, they're tipped to the top. <clears throat> okay, and so it cracks. And so the river goes through the crack. And yeah, these are the up the upslanted layers, and that's exactly what we see. Uh, when we look across at Echo Cliffs and Vermilion Cliffs, they're kind of slanted upright. There was a big bulge right there, and then the uh, Marble Canyon cracked, and the river flows through the bottom of the crack. And then it where does it go? It, under, it undercuts Hopi Lake, chance of that. And so now it undercuts Hopi Lake, which is 250 feet higher. And so now it's, you got two huge <laughs> Great Lakes just gushing through, and that's probably fallen 2,000 feet. Incredible potential energy. And, and it's just going to sheet erode everything. It's going to go down to the Kayabab limestone, and then it's going to spread out and erode everything on top of it. That's why I don't think this happened during the flood, because the Kayabab limestone needed time to get hard. It needed to get hard. It, otherwise, it would, if it would have been soft, it would have cut right through that. Okay, and Walt Brown says that uh, the waterfall, about 13 times higher than Niagara Falls, with possibly 100 times greater flow of water. So that's an incredible amount of water flow, sweeping across that Kayabab limestone. And so now, again, bulging and cracking. So there's no weight on that, on that Kayabab limestone, so it's going to bulge. So now it bulges up. And if you look towards the upper right of that bulge, that's going to explain the, uh, the barbed canyons. So now the subterranean water is flowing downhill to the north underneath the ground. And it's flowing downward to the north, and then it's going to hit the river, and it's going to turn around. And so that's how we got the, the barbed canyons. It goes down there, and it whips around real fast. And some of those layers weren't even rock yet. They were still soft. And so that's going to cause those barbed canyons to cave in. And this is the North Canyon. Notice that layer, it just kind of sloops in. I think that was still soft when, that, when the, those barbed canyons were formed. It just kind of slooped in. You know, that's not your normal layer that you would normally see. Yeah, I don't think that layer was, was rock yet. That's my opinion. You can check it out. And again, bulging and cracking. So now, it's, <laughs> so now the river's cutting through that crack. You know, it bulged, the Kayabab Plateau bulged, and then there was a crack there, and the river through, went through the crack, and it eroded 800 cubic miles of water. So it bulged. This is Kayabab Lime, the Kayabab Plateau. Okay, just think of that. And it bulged, then it cracked, and now all that water is going through the bottom of that crack, and all the, and the, the water table. This is cutting through below the water table. So now the water table is some coming in from the sides and the northern rim goes, it's a thousand feet higher than the southern rim. So you have a lot more water to drain there. It's cutting that much deeper again into the, uh, below the water table. And that's how you're going to get, that's why there's less erosion to the left and there's more erosion to the north because it, it went higher. 
Okay. And it's a thousand feet higher. So that's again, more. And so that's how you got the side canyons. Okay. All that it's cutting below the water table. So all the water tables coming out of the cliff, bringing sediment with it. So that's how you get those riverless side canyons. It was uh, eroded by water, but it wasn't by a river. It was the water table draining out of the ground. And some of those are pretty long, which brings us to the inner gorge. Okay. So now the inner gorge, that's 46 miles long. And it's through crystalline rock. You know, when the river cut down to the, you know, it's cutting through the inner gorge, going deeper and deeper, and then it's going to hit the hard gr granite rock there. It should have spread out and got wider, but it didn't. And that's because it's bulging and cracking again. So the Kayabab Plateau, you know, that rose up and cracked. And then you got 800 cubic miles of water that got, or sediment that got removed. So now there's nothing pushing down on the basement rock. And so the basement rock is what cracks, you know, this is what it should have done. It should have just kept going, getting wider and wider and wider, but it didn't it. And thank you, Brian nickel for all these gra graphics. It didn't, it cracked the basement rock cracked because there was nothing pushing on it. And so that's how you get the inner gorge. And again, <clears throat> and that's, it was, it was just a, a tension crack. Notice the, the faults, notice the, the layers of sediment. You know, it's bulging and cracking. That's the key. So uh, somebody send this to the National Park Service. You can change your website or you can put this theory down on, on there too. And the Grand Canyon was formed by bulging and cracking when two great, or two huge lakes drained. Put that on your website so then people know how it happened. Okay, and bulging and cracking. And that inner, go and that thing's 1,200 feet in certain places. And it was just a tension crack. Okay, where'd all the sediment go? You know, that's what that little kid asked the guy and he's haunted him the rest of his life. Well, there was a lot of water. It's, and it's not in the Delta. The Delta is way too small. You don't have 800 cubic miles of water in the Delta and Brian knuckle nickel did, you know, he, he, he give, does this for comparison. This is from a thousand miles up this, and you can see the deltas and Colorado rivers is way too small. So where did it all go? And again, and it goes, this is a huge floodplain. A lot of it, that, a lot of it is in the floodplain there. Look at the blue part, a huge floodplain. Uh, let's see, Walt Brown says, if, if you're driving east to west in that area and you come across a, like a creek bed, he says, just slow down and look down that creek bed. You're going to see sand and boulders. And he says for like one or 200 miles on, on, on either side of the Colorado River. So that's a lot of, that's a huge floodplain because there was a lot of water and then it's coming out with such tremendous force. It's not going to make a dent Delta. It's going to go right out into that Gulf of uh, California. So that's where a lot of it was. And then some of it may be those Imperial sand dunes in California. And Walt Brown says that if you do an isotope data uh, test on that, you're going to see that it came from grand Canyon, the Imperial sand dunes. And they found large rounded boulders have been found a mile away, a hundred feet above the river at bullhead city. Okay, large, rounded. Okay, let's think about that. Okay, they're large. So that's a powerful river. They're rounded. That's a real powerful river. It's breaking off the sharp edges. Have been found a mile away, and they find them in sand. And that's a sign that the, you know, there's a powerful river that stopped abruptly before the sand could get washed away. So it's powerful, and it stopped. And that would just make perfect sense with huge lakes draining, very powerful, and then they're drained out, nothing to do, and then it stopped. Perfect. And where is Bullhead City? It's 200 miles from the south rim. I mean, that's a huge floodplain. So that's where a lot of that sediment went. And it was interesting too, because um, there's another geologist with a competing theory. They were going to do a, go a week. Uh, you know, they had a competing theories and, and they agreed to, to go to the Grand Canyon with other geologists and show evidence for their theory. And so Walt Brown had three days and then the other geologist was going to have three days. And Walt Brown showed him the stuff, probably the potholes, probably that rock, that rock at Isis Temple and other things. And he did his three days. And then on the fourth day, when it was the other geologist's turn to do it, uh, he didn't have any evidence. And so they went home three days early. And so, but I think it's, I think the guy even criticized the theory even after that, which is really confusing to me. But I didn't want to mention his name. But if you do want to know about it, you go onto page 564 on the ninth edition. And again, to get the ninth edition, it's rsr.org slash HPT. Scroll down to the book, hit the ninth edition button, and it's all yours. You can go to 564 and check it out. Um, so let's review real quick. Okay, the Colorado Plateau, that's, what, that's the key. 
It's a mile above sea level and it's got two huge lakes there, enough water for three grand lakes. And eventually they overflow and they cut a whole bunch of sediment away that caused the potholes and it bulged and it cracked, it washed away so much sediment on Marble Canyon that there was nothing pushing down on it anymore. So the Kaibab limestone cracked and the river went through the crack and it under, under cut Hopi Lake. And so now you got two huge lakes draining, sheet road draining every, and uh, washing everything on top of the Kaibab limestone, washing it clean like a big broom and just swept it all away. And so now there's nothing pushing down on that area. So that's where the Kayabab Plateau rose. And then there's nothing pushing down on it. And again, bulging and cracking the Kayabab Plateau. Other people call it an upwarp, and that's personally what I think. It's more gradual on each side uh, and when it was original. And so then there's nothing pushing down on it. And so then that cracks. And then it cuts out the Grand Canyon so much so that there's nothing pushing down on the in the basement rock and that's how the inner gorge forms so again bulging and cracking three times and that explains your grand canyon you got the facts and the fig so we covered the facts the questions the government answers which do not work so government put this theory in there put that on your web page i pay taxes too so let's have our pers our perspective re represented but you know what happened to uh or is there a bias against people that don't tow the company line and uh, Steve Austin, he submitted his report. He did just documented all these nautiloids. He submitted it to the National Park Service and they took away his license or it took away his permit. They didn't want him doing it anymore. So again, the big elephant in the room is our government education system. They are not going wherever the evidence leads. They are only, their only thing they'll allow for the interpretation of the past is random chance, you know, blind chance and random collisions of atoms. And if you go against that, and even if you show them a, a theory that works, and this one clearly works, it answers everything, even the potholes, even the rocks, it answers everything. Are you going to put that up there? Are you going to go wherever the evidence leads? Are you going to put a theory up there that works that helps people understand this? Or are you going to censor it like you censored Steve Austin? But with that, I think, let's see, we can do any Q&A if I'm here. If I don't know. Is that the plan, Ellen? Uh, we are at break time too, but I'm not going anywhere. So if anybody does have questions, yeah, we can do break time. That's fine. Yeah. We can do, we can do break time. I think yeah, you people, need a break, Brian. Yeah. People can go <laughs> if they want. I got, I'm, I love this stuff. Uh, but I yeah, if, any, if anybody wants to take a few minutes to answer, ask questions, I'd be happy to do it. Okay. Are there two different parts of the denudation? Wait a minute. Yeah, well, are there two different parts of the denudation? Well, I suppose maybe, well, I'm not sure. You got Grand Lake for the Marble Canyon, and then you got both of them for the denudation. Okay, what are the webinar expenses there? Al Helen, how much how uh, much are we how much are you going in the road? Are you gonna sell uh, it? it's we're not exactly sure. Dust hasn't settled yet. <laughs> the dust hasn't settled. So we'll see. Um, yeah, so okay. Uh, yeah, because we we had a we had a web pro coming in for that. Well, not a pro, but somebody was, yeah, gonna, no a pro. Yeah. And, uh, it was going to make it so easy for Ellen <laughs> and uh, instead of it, and then that somehow it didn't happen. But instead of Ellen canceling everything, she says, I'm going to learn how to do this. And by God, thank you so much, Ellen. And there's been some hiccups on the way, but at least no the problem. information is getting out there. So thank you. Yeah. It's been, it's been great getting to meet everybody. Okay. And then people it, asks, I didn't know. The, it yeah. asks what the fees are. And we're just suggesting if people want to chip in 20 bucks, you know, students yeah. 10 bucks, that's great. If you want to give more, I mean, how much is this information worth? How, I mean, if you had to pay on the open market to listen to like four or five PhD scientists in aerospace engineering and nuclear engineering, how much would that cost? How much was their time worth? And we're going to have somebody coming in from the air force Academy tomorrow so, I mean, how much is this information worth? And the more we get, the bigger splash we can make. And we're going to do this again next year, just a matter of when. And uh, why don't you uh, uh, just real quickly talk, uh, mentioned uh, Josh Spencer. The, coming up, we have an expert on radioactivity. That Not everybody's an expert on uh, radioactivity. So, oh, yes. Josh, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Josh Spencer, he's got a, He's a PhD in nuclear engineering. So he's like the 0.1% of the population. He knows what's talking, what he's talking about. And he's going to be talking at, uh, let's see, it's going to be eight o'clock Eastern time, the origin of continental radioactivity. 
And I am so looking forward to that so much. Yeah. I don't know how you got all these PhD guys, Ellen, man. Yeah. This is exciting. Well, I'm really, really the looking thing is I know there's a lot more lurking out there somewhere. There's a lot more out there. So yeah, Feel and that's what I make a way to contact us for next year. We'd like to get more people on board. Well, yeah, there and there's a you know there's a witch hunt for creationists. So some people there are creationists, but they can't say their name. And so my goal is to get these blue or red what red bands that say freedom to think. Get them all over the campus. Who would be opposed to freedom to think, right? And then after that catches hold, that we're going to have freedom to come out of the closet, freedom to be come out of the closet and be a creationist and not get fired. Because people need to see both sides. That's what education is. You see both sides of the issue. But in our government schools, all we see is one side over and over and over again. They're not getting both sides. And when that's happening, that's when you get indoctrinated. And I looked up and uh, brainwashed to be in the dictionary. And it says to be so thoroughly in, in indoctrinated that your beliefs and behaviors change. And I look at America and it's like, our beliefs, have our beliefs and behaviors changed? Oh, most definitely. And we've been brainwashed. And I think we've been brainwashed in the science class because we're only being taught one side. And yet the, 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 the proper perspective of that past, and you're going to see this with Kevin Lee's talk tomorrow at 3 Eastern, is the biblical perspective. It's the one that makes accurate predictions. And those, that perspective of the past that's based on blind chance and random collisions of atoms is just falling apart. It's archaic. It's time to put it on the trash heap of history where it belongs. So then we can let people think wherever the evidence leads them. And then we can have the golden age of science. Because so we got the technology. Now we just need to line it up with the Bible and look out, look what God could do. And so anyhow, that's my soapbox again. I don't know if there was any more questions. But There's if, one. Are you familiar with the Mesa Verde cliff dwellings? Yes. Is is that where they uh, left? It's a, uh, I looked at the shorelines of Grand and Hopi Lakes. Seems to me that Mesa Verde cliff dwellings might have been at the water level and boats would be the access. This is my own thoughts. Does this make sense? I'm I'm not sure where it is, but I'm thinking it was the water that was draining out of this of the it was the water table draining. And there may have been a spring at that place where they could live because there's water and they had the civilization there based on that spring. And then the water table eventually got low enough and dry enough it so that creek dried up. And so then they left. That's my perspective. That's not verifiable, okay. but that's how I there's, put it. Together. There's a question about under the funnel. Um, after the water started flowing, it seems like there would have been more downward pressure with the water there and less likely to bulge would that have prevented the rock from bulging from my understanding the, the lifting off of the sediments unburdened the under the rock below um would the water have provided enough pressure to keep it from bulging then well eventually the water is going to go away you know it's uh it's cutting it down and cutting it down it's like when you make a sand castle and you fill it up with water and it's going to cut that slot all the way down I picture that's how it was when the and during the funnel, and so, there's going to be. Oh, yeah, so the and, amount and of the way, water. And by the way, water is lighter than sediment. I don't know if you. I, I've carried a lot of buckets of water, watering calves and stuff, but then I pick, picked up a bucket of, you know, soil. That stuff's really heavy. I was kind of surprised. So sediment is heavier than rock than water. And the water, the funnel, once the 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 sediment disappeared, the water would be running it might not be filling the entire funnel like as right. the sediment disappeared. So there'd be that less be. water than, is that true? R that, less that water overall than rock. Okay. Yeah, that could be. Yeah. That could uh, be. If I might interject, um, uh, there's a good video uh, that I'll, I'll post a, a link on YouTube to this video and it just shows a, a, a dam, like the process of a dam breaking. Uh -oh. And it shows kind of the, the thickness level of the water and the erosion that happens over time. Of course, this would be on a much smaller scale, but it's still a fairly large scale. And it gives you an idea of how uh, the water would be rushing through there. At any one time, the flow through that funnel would not have been super, super uh thick it wasn't wouldn't have been thousands of feet probably it might have been okay. hundreds of feet but it's so much of it moving at one time and it's just it's eroding off uh the surface of the funnel as it does that and so this video link that i'll post here uh would show that and 
And as that erosion happened, it, it, the, the cracking wasn't so much due to whether or not there was pressure, um, uh, say, pushing it down from the water. Because when yeah. water's flowing, when fluid's flowing, the pressure is actually uh, less than, than you would think. And it was really the, the two uh, cliff formations on either side of it that were still made up of rock that were pushing down and causing the middle portion to bulge. And then that's what led to the tension cracking that led to Marble Canyon. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I think you know this theory better than almost anyone, Brian. Thank you so much for your cause or for the what you've done for the cause. That is incredible. And like you said, that the, the, the dam breaking is going to be at a, a smaller scale of what this would have been, but it's the same. It's the same. That fluid dynamics doesn't really change. It gets more, you know, it changes in in scope and size, but the fundamentals are there. Because, like, you know, when I kayak, it's the same features in the river as when I was a kid, and I'd play, you know, with the little stick. I did this a couple of years ago up in Wisconsin, and I'd putting a stick in the water and following it all the way down. It had the same eddies, the same, you know, the same waves, the same everything. It was just on a real miniature scale but they would be the same with the dams. It's just at a miniature scale. They'd have been a lot more powerful. Okay. But there was somebody that wanted to see how much he had, how much it was left to pay. So we'll, 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 we'll find that number that out. And we'll, we'll find that number out and put a couple of zeros on it and then we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everybody in, in uh, where I live, Everybody can have a dinner break. I don't know <laughs> with, with the different time zones, but cool. Got to give Brian a chance to. Oh, that's fine. Get some dinner. I could uh, probably share my screen and just play this video. Hey, you don't? Okay, yeah. Well, you yeah. can try. We don't know if there's audio. Try. But... <laughs> yeah, one of your videos, Brian. No, but no, this is just a video of a uh, YouTube that I was referring to. Oh, okay. We'll see. Yeah. yeah, Brian, you your stuff is awesome. Oh wow. Oh, wow. That's a pretty steep canyon. Oh, wow. There's going to be a lot of water oh. flowing through that. Uh-huh. You can see all the water rushing in there. Yeah. It's wild. Oh, neat. Neat. Huh. Then if it would have hit rock, it would have spread out and it would have made a funnel. But it keeps getting softer or it keep, keeps going down because it's soft. Huh. See, if I was a kid, I'd be having a stick go through there and go back it up, <laughs> and forth, back and forth. Oh, neat! Wow. There's a little thing in the need. You know, those people that went through the Grand Canyon the very first time—they were—they were pretty brave, I think. Cause they had no idea if that would end in a waterfall. <laughs> yeah. Even but models. you can see that the the thickness of the flow is not actually even in my video. One thing I would probably change is at one point I kind of show it all filled to the brim, and it wouldn't really look like that. I okay it, if I change that, you know, if I ever redo the video, I'd probably probably change yeah. that a little bit. But, mm. Okay. And of course, this is flowing through something much softer than uh, uh, you know. This is just loose sand. It looks like, but kind of gives us a bit of an idea. Yeah. 